So this is the official welcome to Dr. Amy Jill Levine. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, we're gonna start our Q&A. And so as I said a minute ago, if you've just joined, um, you can feel free to write questions for, for Dr. For AJ in the chat and um, I'll filter some of them through. But I thought it'd be nice to just start, ask you to just introduce yourself a bit and in particular how you got into uh, well, why you became a New Testament scholar specifically. It'd <laughs> <laughs> be great to know. Because it's not the aim of every Jewish girl growing up in the United States, right? No. <laughs> um, so I, it, I go by AJ. When I, when I was in graduate school, um, back when Noah was still on the ark, because I'm actually quite old, um, I found that I was not getting the mail, the context that my male colleagues were getting. And one of my faculty members said, go by your initials and pass. Um, so it, as opposed to turning out articles for publication under Amy Jill, um, I, I turned them out under AJ. And, and stuff that, that got rejected under Amy Jill got accepted immediately under AJ. And I'd get invited to conferences and people would say, oh, I didn't realize AJ Levine was a female. Um, sometimes I'd get put up in male dormitories, which was always interesting. And it invariably got me like the bishop's suite with the private bathroom, which was good. Um, so the reason I'm AJ is, is because of issues of gender and sexuality back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, when women on the whole in certain sectors of the academy, and especially uh, in biblical studies and religion, I mean, we, women were not supposed to be there. And it was hard enough having a last name, Levine, which codes Jewish. So um, I got into New Testament studies uh, because when I was growing up, I'm from Massachusetts, so New England. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood, very rural, um, on, on, right on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, where pretty much everybody else was Portuguese Roman Catholic, so fishing village. Um, uh, and I was interested in what my Catholic friends were doing. The first person who registered to me as a Protestant, I met when I went to college, to university. Um, and, and what happened was one day a little girl said to me uh, on the school bus, you killed our Lord. Um, and I recall saying to her with no small degree of, of uh, indignation, I didn't kill anybody because if you killed somebody, you would know. Um, and she said, yes, you did. Our priest said so. And I knew that Roman Catholic priests, I had no idea what an Anglican was. I didn't even know what an Episcopalian was. Uh, but I knew that, that Roman Catholic priests had to wear these special collars. And I thought that the reason they had to wear those special collars with this with little white thing right here was because were the priest to tell a lie, the collar would choke the priest. So I said, is the priest dead? Um, and because, you know, he said I killed God and that seemed to me a lie. Um, and this little girl said no. So I thought, okay, this priest said I'm responsible for the death of God and the caller doesn't kill the priest. So therefore I'm responsible for the death of God. Um, it, this made me extremely confused. Um, when I got off the school bus, I was crying because I thought I had killed God. Uh, my mother who met me at the bus early 1960s said, you know, God's fine. Um, and then I started asking questions. My parents had told me that Christianity was, which meant Roman Catholicism, was very much like Judaism, that we worship the same God, the one who created the heaven and earth, uh, that we prayed the same prayers, most notably the Psalms, uh, that we shared books like Genesis and Isaiah, um, and that a Jewish man named Jesus was very important to my Christian friends. So I couldn't figure out how this religion, which seems so much like Judaism, was saying horrible things about me. So I started going, I asked if I could go to um, religious education class with my friends. We all went to public school, um, which meant that religious religious education class was after school. Um, and uh, my parents, I had, I had great, I had fabulous parents. My parents said to me something along the lines of, as long as you remember who you are, go, you might learn something. It's good to know about other people's traditions. And they said, so I went to religious education class with my friends and I fell in love with the stories. So that's how I got interested in New Testament studies. And when I finally read the New Testament, um, which was many years later, remember I'm seven years old at this point, I realized two things. The first thing I realized that was that we choose how to read. And, and I don't have the, I didn't have the language for it then, but the term would be hermeneutics. It comes after the Greek God Hermes, who, who's the interpreter God who goes between heaven and earth. So we choose how to read. Like, you know, we have TV critics and book critics and movie critics. So we choose how to see a movie or read a book, and some of us like it and some of us don't, and the critics can tell us why. So I thought to myself, the people who were teaching me this religious education stuff, mostly nuns, but some lay people, they chose not to read their text in an anti-Jewish manner. Because you can read the New Testament and come out as an anti-Semite. You don't have to. 
but you could. So I thought, what's the mechanism by which people read graciously rather than malevolently? And if somebody can teach me what that is, I want to teach it to other people. And the other thing that I realized was that I was getting Jewish history that the synagogue did not hold. Because in the synagogue, we're very good up until the Hanukkah story, which is the books of the Maccabees, which are in some Christian canons, but they're not in Jewish canons because they're written in Greek, not Hebrew. Um, we're good up to the Maccabees, which is the second century BCE, BC, and then like magic, we're over into the early third century common era or AD, if you prefer, um, which is the, the rabbinic documents. So if I want to know about Jewish history in the first century, the New Testament is actually a very good resource. And I teach at Vanderbilt University, uh, where my primary job is to train people who want to be Christian ministers how to read the New Testament, which is a strange job for a Jew. And I'm not a Messianic Jew. I'm not, I'm not a Jesus believer. I'm not baptized. Um, I just think the New Testament is fascinating. And I think Jesus is fascinating. And I've just dedicated my life to studying this stuff because it's fascinating. Thank you. I mean, it's been so helpful to us. I think we've been looking at parables in our church for like the last, I don't know, six, it feels like forever, six months. And <laughs> discovery, I pretty much check what you say about it <laughs> before I teach anything about it. It's been really, really helpful for us to kind of ground ourselves in the, in the context. I think that's something more and more as a lot of us go through kind of spiritual deconstruction processes yeah. to, to really understand the context in which things were happening, which sometimes well, in church, lots of assumptions are made that we kind of just assume are true. And um, so stripping things away, and you've really helped us to do that. So I'm just gonna share a question from Olivia. She says, was it normal for Passover to begin with a type of parade or victory parade, as you called the triumphal entry, or was this unusual? And does Passover traditionally have much of a festival atmosphere? Oh, Pass Passover is remarkably festive. Um, at the time of Jesus, it's, it was one of, well, still one of the three pilgrimage festivals, except once the temple was burnt down, pilgrimage became a bit of a problem. Um, so it was a joyous time. Um, people came from all over the, the Mediterranean world, as well as North Africa and points to the east. Um, it was an opportunity to visit with friends. And it was an opportunity for people to eat meat because the, the normal food for most people, um, vegetables, fish, but you know, actually meat. So you get a lamb from the temple and that's your dinner. Um, it's the Feast of Freedom, so it's a sense of, you know, celebrating your national identity. Um, you're looking forward to 50 days later, which is Shavuot weeks in Greek, Pentecost. Um, but in terms of a triumphal entry, no, because it wasn't like they were expecting every year some person who was claimed a king to come in. Um, the only kind of triumphal entry you really had was that Pontius Pilate and his retinue who are normally out by the ocean by Caesarea Maritima, where it's you know cool and you got this good ocean breeze, right? Um, Pilate would bring his um, troops uh, into the city. There was always a, a contingent of Roman army officers in the city, but he'd bring in you know like the show of force. So what the Roman um, governors did, and Rome was basically in charge of Judea, which is where Jerusalem is, from about from about the year six of the Common Era. Um, they would bring their troops in to say, okay, all you Jews celebrating your feast of freedom. And this was the big feast. Passover was that big deal. Um, guess who's in charge? So we're just here ostensibly to keep the peace, but we're also here um, to, to fly the flag of Rome to show you that we are in charge and you're not getting free from us. So if there were any sort of parade coming in, it, it would have been Pilate coming in. Um, and it's not a victory parade because the conquering had been done at least by the time of Jesus, you know, three decades before. So um, there are two scholars um, now deceased, Marcus Borg um, and John Dominic Crossan, um, who have this image of when Pilate's coming in from one side, Jesus is coming in from the other, and it's you know which parade do you want to follow? Um, and it's it's by no means clear that that's that's the way it happened historically, but I think it's a nice image to hold in mind. Uh, since Jesus is being hailed as a king, you can see that in particular in the Gospel of John chapter 6, um, when the people wanted to make him a king. He's coming in as a king. Um, you've got in Matthew and John the citation from Zechariah, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Um, and it, the readers of Mark and Luke would have known that prophecy. So, you know, did it happen the way the Gospels reported? It depends upon the Gospel you're looking at. There's another question here about food and Passover. And I, I know there's some discussion with, with the Passover meal. Was the Last Supper the Passover meal? Um, how did that fit in? Was it typical to have bread and wine? 
Um, it, well, generally, except for Yom Kippur or other fast days, you're going to have wine with pretty much everything. And, and even poor people had wine. They just watered it down a lot. Um, uh, the Passover meal, it, the Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is a Passover meal. The Last Supper in John is not. Um, John, because in John, Jesus is killed at the times that the at the time that the lambs that would have been eaten for the Passover meal are being sacrificed in the temple. Now, which one's historical? This is very hard to determine. For John, the symbolism is 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 perfect because John, be, the, in the first chapter of John, John the Baptist says about Jesus, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." So you got all this lamb imagery. Um, and then you have the Passover sacrifice, which is in fact a lamb. The Passover sacrifice is not a sin offering, by the way. So John kind of repurposed it. Um, but although the symbolism is perfect, that could also have been the way it worked because the chronology in John actually makes more sense historically. Um, uh, Jesus talks about, um, you know, I, you know, I would have wanted to eat this feast with you, and I'm not going to eat until we get into the kingdom. Of that would be weird if the Last Supper were a Passover meal because he eats the Passover meal. Uh, the word bread, the New Testament is written in this Greek, is, the word you bread listen to this. Artos, amazing. Um, and um, artos, it just means any sort of bread product. So it could refer to pita, it could refer to matzah, it could refer to pumpernickel. Yeah. Um, so is it normal to have bread and wine at a meal? <laughs> yes. Um, the Passover meal that we celebrate today, it's called a seder. The word seder, seder is actually modern Hebrew as well. Beseder, if you go to Israel and somebody says, like the guard says to you, beseder, it means it's okay. Seder means order. So beseder means it's all in order. Like your paperwork is okay. We'll let you into the country. Your pa pa you know, Stamp your passport, beseder, you're good to go. Um, the Passover meal, the seder as we have it today is a rabbinic uh, invention. It was not um, the way Jesus would have done the Passover meal. I mean, there are connections. But the Passover meal in Jesus' time, as best as we can reconstruct it, um, on the plate, on the table would have been a lamb that was sacrificed in the temple. So you have to go get it from the temple. Um, you're there with your friends and family. It's supposed to be eaten with family. You would have matzah and you would have bitter herbs. So today, horseradish, arugula works, um, scallions work. Um, there's a variety of ways of getting these bitter herbs out. Um, shallots can work for some people. Um, but all the other stuff that we've got, um, that's, that's, that's post, that's post Jesus time. And at the time of Jesus, you were supposed to eat the Passover meal within the environs of the city of Jerusalem, as opposed to, you know, like my dining room table last night. So changes, changes in the Passover celebration, um, just as you see changes in celebration of the last supper or Eucharist or communion or Lord's supper, whatever you want to call it substantially changed over time. So all religions have meals and all those meals change. And that's the way religions work. And that, that's what keeps us alive. So in Judaism today, questions about what, what can you and can you not eat? And that actually varies among different groups of Jews. So what Eastern Europeans, like Fiddler on the Rufi Jews, um, or Ashkenazic Judaism. So German, Russian, Polish, um, Ukrainian, Romanian, um, they have their own traditions. And then if you go to Eastern um, forms, Sephirad, um, so Spanish Jews, Greek Jews, um, there's a whole separate Yemenite tradition. There are African Jews. And a lot of the food stuff is actually dependent upon what's available there at the time. And that wouldn't surprise you either, how Eastern Orthodox Christians do Eucharist is different than how Anglicans do it, than how Baptists do it. That's great. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions here that are about uh, atonement theories. I think one of the things a lot that we've, we've wrestled with as a community is how we relate to atonement. And lots of us comes from, come from, you know, backgrounds where penal substitution is the, is the only atonement that's taught. And so there's a few questions here. Naomi, I wonder if you might want to just speak your question out. I can do. I am... Um... I, do, I wasn't really sure how to word it, but what I ended up with was um, I've often heard that of penal substitutionary atonement theories justified yeah. by Christians as almost an extension or a fulfillment of Jewish law um, and Jewish perspectives of justice. And I'm wondering to what degree Jewish people would say that that's true or whether that's a selective reading of what Jewish teaching says about sacrifice and justice. Yeah, I think Jews would find that just a very weird way of understanding Judaism. <laughs> Um, there are multiple forms of sacrifice in antiquity. 
um, of which very, very few were sin offerings. There are whole burnt offerings, there are thanksgiving offerings, there are festal, festal offerings, there are commemorative offerings. So when you get to the Passover sacrifice, that's not a sin offering. Uh, but Jews are also well aware that uh, they know what it's like to be without a temple because they, first of all, they didn't have one until Solomon. Uh, then that one got burnt down by the Babylonians in 587 BCE. And then they didn't have another one until about 515 or so when they started rebuilding the one that Jesus eventually got to. And they lost that one in 70 and they haven't had one since. So Jews already knew that you did not need animal sacrifice in order to get atonement. The system was if you had a temple, you sacrificed the animal. But if you didn't have a temple, it didn't matter, right? Um, so we're very practical people. Um, Jews have a very strong sense of a God who is always um, welcoming us back into the fold if we screw up. Um, our job is not to be perfect. I mean, if we can manage it, that's great. Set the bar high. Um, but if you screw up, and people generally screw up because we're human beings, not gods, um, there are all sorts of mechanisms to get you back in a relationship with God. So the dominant Jewish term for all this is um, uh, S-H-U-V, shuv, which means to turn. And the metaphor suggests getting off the wrong path and getting back on the right path. So you turn from your, your sinful ways to, to your righteous ways. Uh, the word for repentance is tshuva. So it's based on that shuv, that turning root. Um, and um, God is always waiting for somebody who's gotten off the path to get back on the path. We're also highly communal. So that even in something like the Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. Like if you sin, you're supposed to fix it, but Yom Kippur is the catch-all in case you missed anything. Um, uh, all the prayers are in the plural. So the entire congregation, and then you just list off the sins, and there's a long list because there are a lot of bad things that people can do. You know, uh, forgive us for gossiping. Uh, forgive us for um, uh, not being kind when we had the opportunity to do so, along with forgive us for stealing, forgive us for murders, forgive us for various um, you know, adultery or infidelity crimes and whatnot. And, and everybody recites that with the idea being that we are all responsible for each other. Um, in Leviticus, so Leviticus 19 is the love your neighbor as yourself and love the stranger who dwells among you. Leviticus 19 also says right before the love your neighbor as yourself, um, it says, if you see your neighbor doing something wrong, you're supposed to rebuke your neighbor, right? Um, it's called tochecha, rebuke, um, which means we're all responsible for each other. Um, you get a hint of that in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, uh, where Jesus instructs his followers, if there's somebody in the church, somebody in the assembly that, who's doing something wrong, you go have a chat. And if that doesn't work, you, you know, two or three go. And if that doesn't work, you send a committee. And if that doesn't work, you send the entire church. And if that doesn't work, you make that person to be like a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, you disfellowship the individual and then you go re-evangelize. Okay. So they never quite let you go. Um, and the synagogue functions along the same lines. Uh, but we don't have a sense of penal substitution. Um, there was a, a one, remember, there's never been a head Jew to tell us what to do. So Judaism has always been extremely diverse. And you can see that in the New Testament with like the Pharisees who don't agree with the Sadducees, who don't agree with the people up in Galilee, who probably didn't agree with the folks who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, who don't show up in the New Testament. But that's another group that's out there. You got Paul in the diaspora doing his Paul thing. Um, one... <laughs> One way to understand how people think about the sin stuff is to determine what metaphors they use. So in Judaism, sin has a thingness to it. It's not an abstract category. It's, got, it's, it's a real thing that does real damage. Um, it can attach uh, to, um, to the temple in terms of purity issues. Um, so the temple has this kind of uh, impurity attraction like sin gloms on and therefore you have to, you know, get yourself out of sin and get yourself purified and get the temple purified. That's where all that blood stuff comes in because blood is a detergent. Everybody knew blood was a detergent. Blood can cleanse from sin. So how do we understand that? Because they use the metaphor of sin as stain. Um, they also use the metaphor of sin as burden that needed to be lifted up. Um, and you can see that with people who feel guilty about something, because sometimes like their body language, they'll hunch over. They, they can't they feel that they can't stand up straight. And then when that guilt is gone or when they confess their sins, they actually that you can actually see it physically. Um, they also thought of sin as a debt. 
And they had this image in the first century that there were actually um, treasure boxes up in heaven. So think like safety deposit boxes or bank vaults. Right? And whenever you sinned, you drew down against your account. Um, uh, so how do you get how do you, how do you fill your account again? Um, you do tzedakah, you, you do deeds of charity, you do deeds of kindness, and that refills the box. And that's probably why in Matthew and Mark, and, and you can see this language in other New Testament documents as well. Um, the image of Jesus dying is a ransom. So the ransom idea is by his death, um, his his enormous fidelity refills those treasure boxes and you get a reboot, you get a redo. So they had various ways of understanding atonement then and now. But atonement in Judaism predominantly is God wants you to repent. God always wants you to repent. And God is a forgiving God. Um, there are sins against God that, that God forgives. But God does not generally forgive a sin against a fellow human being if you can fix it. Right. So I like I can't I can't steal from Danielle. Um, uh, and then say, dear God, I'm so sorry, I stole against Danielle, can you fix it? I have, I have to make restitution directly to somebody whom I've hurt. So the Yom Kippur tradition is, the Day of Atonement tradition is, you have a month to get ready for it, because it takes a long time to recollect what you've done wrong and how you can do things better. And the idea is during that month, you say to anybody you've hurt, I'm so sorry. And it's both a hurt directly, I'm so sorry I you know, passed on that gossip about your gallbladder, or, you know, whatever. Um, but it's also, I'm so sorry I didn't call you after your surgery. I should have done that. Yeah. So you make amends for both sins committed and om committed and omitted. So that when you begin the new year on Rosh Hashanah, you begin it with, with as best a clean slate as you can possibly have. That's really helpful. <laughs> um, so what I'm hearing you say is that the, the forgiveness is like, it's a, it helps us. I mean, it's it, like we we are the ones that are burdened. It's not a matter of keeping the clean slate so that you can then move yeah, on. Yeah, you're, expe you're expected to screw up. Yeah. Um, and th uh, that's one of the good things about the New Testament is, is you can watch the disciples screw up royally, right? You get this great entry and then what happens? Within a week, Peter's denying Jesus. Judas has betrayed him. The disciples run off and flee. Everybody screws up. Uh, and with the exception of Judas, who in the Gospel of Matthew get, hangs himself, probably out of guilt, and then you have to wonder about what do we do with people who are so guilty that, that in fact they take their lives and aren't they part of the community too? And how do we provide solace to their families? Um, you get a do-over. And Easter is kind of like the big do-over, which is great. So you reset. And then you try not to make the mistakes you had made the previous year, and you try to live into the future as a better person. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we can open it up if there's some other questions around this area of atonement. There's a few follow-up ones that have come in the chat. Um, Claire, you had a question, follow-up question. Um, did you want to ask it? About just sin. a meeting. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was just um, when you were talking about, about sin, the idea of sin, and I, I teach Greek religion, so... Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering if it was akin to the idea of, of miasma and... Oh, yes. Yes. That's a wonderful question. Yeah. yeah. Um, because miasma also has a sense of something sticking to something else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, to, you have to get like a, a cleaning or thereabouts. So yeah. it is that sense. Um, and, and that's why Greek temples also have purification rituals and you can't enter them unless there's... in many of them, unless there's some sort of ablution beforehand, mm -hmm. right? Because um, it's... I mean, the best English word that I have is stuff. Um, and miasma, like sin, adheres. And then you have to figure out some way of cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And it adheres spiritually and it adheres physically. Mm -hmm. It's a combination. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, fabulous question. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Any other follow-up questions on this kind of area of atonement, sin? Um, I can see, I, well, I can <laughs> see a question in the chat from Roger, which is, these are great. God, you guys are good. They're um, smart. <laughs> the, the concept of salvation in Judaism is more communal and national than in Christianity. Absolutely. Um, so you start getting images of um, national restoration in Ezekiel with the vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. 
Um, and that's the sense of national, national salvation is repatriation to the homeland following forced exile. Um, eventually you start getting um, uh, that image floating into ideas of final judgment and resurrection, but it's still very, very much communal because of the sense that everybody's responsible for each other. Um, so you get the sense of the people Israel. The reason it shifts uh, to the, the Christian individual model is because Christianity is, is and, and it's not a complete rupture. I mean, there's some individual stuff in Judaism and there's some communal stuff in Christianity, um, uh, is because Jews and Christians are comported differently. If you think about religion, as, and this is, a, this is a terrible definition of religion, um, but work with me on this. Um, if, if you think about religion as something that you get into by belief, detached from your parents, detached from ethnicity, detached from geography, uh, then Christianity more or less invented religion. Because even to go back to Greek religion, even in some of the other forms of Greek religion or, or religion that was popular in the first century or superstitio, Isis still had an Egyptian connection and Mithra still had a Persian connection. Um, so there was this kind of landed idea um, and you could affiliate in. Um, uh, Christianity detached itself from geography and very, very quickly detached itself from the land of Israel. So the Gentile churches. Um, therefore it became individual. Jews never settled down just to be religion. They always, the, the dominant sense was a peoplehood, which is why you can have atheist Jews. Um, in the same way you can have atheist US citizens, although you can't get elected, um, or, you know, or atheist Brits. I mean, it, it works across, it, for, for national groups because you're born into it. Um, so if you get in by belief, then you start getting a strong sense of the individual because it's the individual who goes from being outside to going to being inside. And you can see that sense in the Gospel of John where Jesus says you have to be born anew or you have to be born from above. So if you get in on an individual basis, it's not surprising that soteriological concerns or salvation issues come on an individual basis. So that is why do you think that there's such an in interest in who is in and who is out in all Christian groups. Uh, yeah, but, but there's also that same problem in Jewish groups. So everybody who's Jewish, and there's probably some outlier because there always is. Um, if your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. But now you have problems. Did your mother convert? If so, who converted her? And now you start getting into difficulties. And you can see those difficulties played out even today um, in terms of what's called the right of return to the land of Israel where you can become an Israeli citizen if you're a Jew, but then there's a question of who counts as a Jew. Um, and the state of Israel has also made suggestions along the lines of if you're clearly Jewish, like your mother's a Jew and that's not in doubt, but you convert to Christianity, do you count or do you not count? So although Jews are comported as a people, the, religion, the question of religion becomes a problem here. So you can get in if you're an atheist, but you can't get in under the law of return if you're a convert to Christianity. Nothing so the big is... issue for Paul is um, what are the boundaries that you must be within to call yep. yourself a Christian? You know. Right, but I have to rephrase your question um, because Paul doesn't use the word Christian. So mm -hmm. even when we start talking about Christians, which is again shorthand, we're, generally we're importing a lot of post New Testament stuff onto it, um, you know, like like formal hierarchies and all that. And, and Paul, with Paul, it's all kind of in coed. Um, so here's the thing with Paul, as best as I can determine it. Although you know, New, New Testament scholars, we make our money trying to figure out what Paul was talking about, as they say in the American South, bless his heart. Um, Paul's a Jew, and that seems pretty clear. And, and Paul in Philippians says, I'm a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, as to the law of Pharisee, righteousness under the law, blameless, which means he's not feeling guilty because he can't fulfill, he's not, a, he's not Luther. Okay. Um, but Paul is a Jew who thinks the Messianic age has broken through. And one of the dominant signs of the Messianic age, speaking of things like final judgment and resurrection of the dead, um, is that in the Messianic age, the Gentile nations, Gentiles, pagans, whatever you want to call them, um, the the non-Jews um, will turn to worship the God of Israel. So they give up their pagan religious practices. So going to the local temple, for example, eating meat offered to idols, uh, participating in the state cult, and they go worship the God of Israel. But they don't convert to Judaism. So the, the prophet Zechariah, who's the one who comes up with the triumphal entry image, by the way, the prophet Zechariah talks about 
the time when 10 Gentiles, 10 pagans, um, will grab hold of the, of, of the Jew and say, take me with you to Zion so we can worship your God. Okay. But they don't say, circumcise us when we get there. In other words, they come in as pagans who are no longer worshiping pagan gods, they're worshiping the Jewish God. And for Paul, who, who has some of, and Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles, so he's not, he's not, convert, he's not in the business of converting Jews, that's Peter's job. He's in the business of, of getting these Gentiles to worship the God of Israel. And some of them are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, you gave us this book, this would be the Septuagint, the, the Greek Bible, and it talks about Abraham being circumcised, and if we're children of Abraham, maybe we should do that too. And moreover, and this goes back to, to questions of Greek religion, um, it, 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 pretty much everybody in the Roman Empire knew that the Jews weren't going to worship the Greek gods, and they sort of, and they weren't going to work on the Sabbath, and they weren't going to eat pork, and they had all these other funny customs. But you know, it's just, so they're Jews. Just let them do it, because otherwise it's going to be a problem. But what happens if you're one of these ex-pagan pagans who's no longer worshiping the state gods and no longer worshiping the empire's gods, because you're worshiping the Jewish god, but you're not a Jew? That's politically dangerous. Because now you're denying the state gods and boy, that, you know, the gods can desert you and the next thing you know, you're being conquered or there's a famine or there's a flood. Um, so Paul's trying to make sure that his ex-pagan pagans aren't converting to Judaism. Although some of them are suggesting maybe we should because it's politically expedient and it is what Jesus did and it is what Paul did. Um, and Paul says, no, because if you pagans convert to Judaism, then the only people who would be worshiping God would be Jews. But the Messianic age says that Jews and Gentiles together as equals worship the God of Israel. So Paul's also got to worry about who is in and who's out. And, and you know, the good thing about Paul was that he let in everybody. Um, and then the church for the next 2000 years has to figure, had to figure out what do we do with them now that they're all in? And, and what do we do if they apostatize, if they, if they, if they turn back to their pagan ways, whether because it was convenient or because it was politically expedient or because they were about to get killed? What do you do with people we've let in, but they've still kept their pagan practices? They're still eating meat off her titles. What do you do with them? What do you do with intermarriages? Huge questions for Paul. And the church is still working on. So I had a, a question about your earlier statement about um, Christianity being um, more individual, individual. I understand that being true in the contemporary context, but my understanding is that historically um, there was a very communal aspect because of the understanding of the body of Christ right. and seeing that in Paul with all, with all members being part of the body. So how would you understand like that aspect of the communal nature of Christianity and, and the individual nature? Sure, thank you for that. So clarification, I, I believe I said there, there, it, it's not a complete break and there's individual on one side and there's communal on the Christian side. Absolutely. Um, so in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us the idea of the church is, is comprised of the body of Christ and, and, and different, different parts of the body have different job descriptions, but they all have to work together. Um, you start seeing a, a change in the metaphor when you get to Colossians where Christ is the head and the church is the body. And eventually that metaphor, it stays, but it plays less of a part than it did. Um, you start getting political ideas like you can't have God as your father unless you've got the church as your mother. And now the church is your mother, but you're not part of that body because the metaphor has changed. So there's always been a communal sense. Um, but because of this concern for heresy, they're always trying to weed out who's in and who's not. Um, Jews don't have less of a problem with heresy so that in Judaism, and Jews have heretics, but there still are heretics, right? Um, and you can see that in rabbinic literature with somebody like Alicia Benabuya, who's a heretical rabbi, but they're still citing his stuff. Um, and it's that concern for orthodoxy versus heresy that pushes the individual as opposed to the communal. Um, the church has always kept the communal model, but it hasn't worked with it the way it should, right? So what I tell my students today who were, you know, face, so um, in the United Methodist Church, which is not the same thing as the British Methodist Church, um, in the United Methodist Church, they're about to have a schism and then COVID hit, so they haven't had been able to meet together, which may be a good thing. Um, and they're about to have a schism over um, GBLTQI issues. Well, it's not even over that, it's about uh, GL, or, you know, that, that's as far as that they're going to go. Um, and when you start talking about the body of Christ, 
say, you know, can't you hold themselves together? And and people who, who are interested in, in schisming out are saying that's not the metaphor we're using anymore. We can't use it. So I, I want them to take their baptism more seriously because baptism is supposed to be just as indelible as anything else. And that puts you in the body of Christ and people ought not to be able to throw you out because of it, but they still are. Thanks. Yeah, I, I went to a United Methodist seminary. So uh, during all that, so I saw it. Thank you. Yeah, where did you go? Methodist Theological School in Ohio. Oh, Methesco. Yeah, mm-hmm. Methesco. I guess it's one of those things, it's a human thing, isn't it? To try to find reasons why you, I belong and you don't, or... Um... Um, yeah, it's, it's the struggle between particularity and universalism, and, and there's a place for each, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes boundaries and borders are extremely helpful, and sometimes they're extremely dangerous. And then you, ha- you have to negotiate when you put those in there. And, and we're always determining who's in and who's out. Mm. Mm. Well, you, you mentioned um, uh, LGBT and uh, inclusion and exclusion. And there's a couple questions in the chat that would be helpful to hear your perspective on around sure. um, what's the, the classical Jewish view on LGBT inclusion. And uh, someone mentioned they feel like um, Jewish communities have been more inclusive than the church historically. Yeah, it depends upon the Jewish community you're mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah. Right. Um, so Jews are divided in uh, various, I guess, mo- denominations is the wrong word, but movements might be best or groups. Um, in, in all but orthodoxy, everything is open and affirming across the board. Um, uh, orthodoxy has a problem, um, and there are degrees of orthodoxy. So my own synagogue is what's called modern orthodox, um, and we play don't ask, don't tell. So we have a number of same-sex couples in our um, uh, in, in our synagogue and nobody says anything one way or the other, um, but the rabbi won't say something officially affirming. He'll come as close as he can and then he'll, he'll pull back. Uh, and when he does make comments along those lines, he uses them in terms of uh, politics rather than internal synagogue liturgical issues. Um, ultra-orthodox, ultra-orthodoxy, and now we're talking about black hats and side curls and women with dresses down to the floor and, and either wigs or head coverings. Um, it's still a huge problem. Um, so people are trying to work from the inside and there have been some really good, there's been some really good work done on um, uh, 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 GLBTQI Jews in orthodoxy. So I'm seeing slow movements among some of the leaders, but the hardcore, they're really pretty not good. Um, including the, the ultra-orthodoxy in Israel, which, which finds anything to be, uh, th- that's not um, uh, heterosexual sex for the purpose of creating children to be a problem. Um, Reform Judaism, your liberal Judaism, uh, conservative Judaism, majority Judaism, all find no problem. Um, it, we come at the, Jews and Christians, broadly speaking, come at the whole issue of sexuality through different sources. Um, so Christians are inclined to read the so-called clobber passages in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, in, um, uh, for, in Romans, in 1 uh, Corinthians, and in 1 Timothy. Um, Jews will read the material in Leviticus through the lens of the Talmud, and then moving on. So we're dependent upon different texts. For 12 years, well, I founded and then ran for 12 years something called the Carpenter Program in Religion, Gender, and Sexuality. Um, basically, my dean at Vanderbilt a number of years ago said, here's, said, here's $2.5 million, develop a religion, gender, and sexuality program. And I went, okay, I can do that. Um, and the idea was to bring people who would normally uh, not speak with each other, who would, you know, strongly divided opinions, uh, to come and sit at the same table and try to work out how you come to some sort of, of healthy conclusion, because literal, literally lives are at stake. So um, uh, uh, gay youth, abortion, uh, women's roles in churches that will not ordain women, um, uh, 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 gender transition surgery, alternative gender identification, I mean, you know, pretty much everything. And a lot of it had a science component to it. Um, a lot of it was involved with children's education. Uh, oh. My favorite one was, um, if, if you're over 85, can you have sex out of wedlock? And I'm thinking, you know, God bless you. But, you know, and so and you had all these like guilty older adults 
um, who, whose libido was still active, but they had been widowed or, and, and, you know, and what can they do because their kids didn't want them to get, that was like my favorite program ever. Um, and what I found in a number of cases, particularly in working with conservative Christians, um, they wanted something to hang a, um, a more positive, open and affirming approach on the Bible because they were so worried that they were doing something that God would not want them to do. And that was their concern. So their hearts were inclined in the let's be open and affirming, but their minds were thinking, I can't do that if God considers that to be a sin. So I, as a biblical scholar, spent a lot of time trying to find them alternative readings. Um, and, and they often found that quite helpful. Um, and because, because I'm a member of an Orthodox synagogue, which is not itself open and affirming, I'm just fighting it from the inside. Um, and I don't think that makes you, I don't think Roman Catholic people are traitors if they're still attending the Roman Catholic Church, which is not terribly open and affirming. Um, you know, you fight it from the inside. You can choose to leave, you can choose to stay. Um, things like, well, um, first of all, we don't know exactly what the Bible is talking about in those so-called clobber passages. If the text had simply said, don't put your penis here, okay, then I would know what it meant. But it doesn't say that. So Leviticus, which is the, the in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, which are the go-to clobber passages in Torah, it says, you male person, it doesn't even say man, it says you male person, um, shall not lie with a man the lyings of a woman. Now, I think that means you male person shall not penetrate another man as you would penetrate a woman, but it doesn't actually say that. Um, and since I'm not exactly sure what it means, I'm hesitant to make a law on it, but let's say it does mean that. Um, then we're talking about anal penetration. You know, so my next comment is, well, okay, for the Old Testament, I'm just gonna use Christian terminology here. For the Old Testament, sexuality apparently means doing something with a penis. Okay, that means any, anything that two women do, not a problem, because lesbianism is never mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, you, you start getting references to it in rabbinic literature and the rabbis are, they debate. Some, no, you shouldn't. Some, well, what difference does it make? Or no, they're not doing anything. Why, you know, how, how could we possibly imagine women doing anything? Because um, there's no penis. So if there's no penis, there's no sex, there's no problem. So, so the rabbis actually debate this and eventually they determine that lesbianism is not good either. <laughs> you can see the debates. Um, uh, the next question that I, I, I want my students to ask is if you want to make a law that's, that says anal intercourse is forbidden, um, why? What's the purpose of this law? So I can see a law forbidding something like adultery because I would not be happy you know, under the circumstances. I can see where that would break up a relationship. Um, so what is it? Is it to keep the birth rate up? No, because if it were to keep the birth rate up, the Old Testament would have forbidden masturbation and it doesn't, right? And, and you know, unless your aim is really interesting, that's not gonna up the birth rate. Um, or sleeping with a woman who's already pregnant because she's not gonna get pregnant again or um, uh, heterosexual anal intercourse, which is not forbidden, or, um, or oral sex, which is not forbidden. There's a lot of stuff the Old Testament could have mentioned, but doesn't. So it's not population. It's not behaving like Canaanites because Canaanites also have heterosexual sex. That's how you get little Canaanites. So that's not it. Um, it's not fear of anal tearing, because again, that would have been forbidden to women and that's not there. So you think of all these different reasons, not there. Um, so the primary, the reason I think it's there is because the Old Testament is interested in gender roles. Men do men things and women do women things. Um, so men can't dress as women, women can't dress as men. Okay. Um, and this, this is part of this idea of separation. And, and the whole text is about separation. Right, the creation narrative, you separate the darkness from the light and the waters above from the waters below. Um, you separate the days of the week from the Sabbath. You separate the people Israel from the Gentile nations. So separation. So you have men doing men things and women doing women things. Um, but then you realize that all of those gender roles are artificially constructed, right? Uh, men barbecue, women bake, right? Then you go watch the Great British Bake Off and you realize that's not actually the way it works. Um, so I think that's what's going on. Don't treat you male person, don't treat another man as if he's a woman. That's screwing up gender roles. Okay. So if that's what it means, um, then what about to go back to creation? And this is actually a page from the Jesus playbook. 
when asked about divorce, um, Jesus says you can't get divorced, and he cites Genesis, right? That's a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. And what God has joined together, let no person separate. Okay. So that's Jesus. Well, how about this? In Genesis, in the creation narrative in Genesis chapter one, everything is fabulous. It was day one, and God saw, every, God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was terrific, and God saw that it was wonderful. Um, the Hebrew word is tov, good, 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 good. And the first time God says something is not good, loto, um, God says, and I'm at the beginning of Genesis 2 here, it is not good for the human being. The Hebrew is ha-adam, the human being. It is not good for the human being to be alone. I will make a helper as his partner. Okay. So if God says it's not good for the human being to be alone, why would I condemn a gay person to a life of singleness and celibacy? And then my students go, oh. Well, maybe I can put Genesis over against Leviticus and read that way in the same way Jesus put Genesis over against Deuteronomy, which gives you permission to divorce and move on. Or if I were to go to Romans, where Paul talks about something that is contrary to nature, but he doesn't tell us what he's talking about. He's probably talking about same-sex relations, but he doesn't tell us. That. But let's say he is. If Paul says it's contrary to nature, and then my students go, but it's contrary to nature, I say, well... If you move on in the epistle to the Romans, when Paul talks about the salvation of the Gentiles being grafted onto the root of Israel, contrary to nature, and that's exactly the same term that he uses, then the only way the Gentiles can gain their salvation is by an act that's contrary to nature. Why would you think that's bad? Or if you want an act that's contrary to nature, and here you're using medical terminology, um, to, open up, um, to open up a uterus and operate on a fetus to save that fetus's life is about as contrary to nature as anything that I can possibly think of. And thank God you can do that. So let's re be concerned about contrary to nature. To note that the word homosexual never shows up in the New Testament because it hadn't been coined until the 1880s. Thank you, Kraft Ebbing. Um, and words that are sometimes translated homosexual don't mean homosexual. Um, so you have the word um, in the vice list, malakos. A malakos is just a soft person. Amalekos is a guy who spends more time uh, on the couch than in the gym, um, or who drives an automatic rather than a stick shift, um, uh, or who spends more time in the harem than with the army, right? Um, you have um, a, a term arsenokotoi, which is a neologism in Paul. We don't have it. Arsen means male. And kotoi, is, it means bed, but it's where we get co coitus. So an arsenokotoy or, or male bedders, but I don't know whether that's putting other people in people's beds, whether it means same-sex intercourse. I don't know what the word means. And if you don't know what a word means, why would you base the law on it? So there's more that can be said about that. That's a whole lecture in itself. Uh, but what I try to do with people who are trying to be open and affirming, but are worried about what the Bible says, to make it clear that the Bible is not always clear on what the Bible says. Luther thought that, that um, um, Arsenokotoy had something to do with masturbation. Right? Um, it, we actually don't know what the Bible says in all cases. And in some cases, the Bible is really affirming about partnership. So where do you want to put your foci? Where do you want to put your lenses? Where do you want to concentrate? <clears throat> wow, thank you. <laughs> I think, you know, <clears throat> for us, uh, a lot of times when people I've experienced, when people are say things like, but the Bible says this, they're making this blanket statement. And really when you're questioning some of the traditional teachings around sexuality and gender, what you're really doing is saying, well, the Bible is a lot more complex than you think it is. And you can't read it the way that you always have. So it's shaking some foundation that's yeah. underneath. It's more than that. They've, a number of people will turn the Bible into a God this is called bibliolatry. You know, the Bible says that I believe it. That's the end of it. That makes your book your God, as opposed to the book is, the book points to the God. It's not divinely dictated. Um, and even when Second Timothy talks about all scripture is inspired, um, the Greek scripture here is graphe, like graphology. Um, he's really talking about the Old Testament. And he's very clear that it's inspired for certain things, but it's not inspired to be, you know, a sociology book or a science book. Um, and even when something is inspired, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's entirely right. That was an inspired performance. Of course, you hit the wrong note on the arpeggio, 
that was an inspired storm. And although I really didn't like what you had to say about something or other. I'm, I'm conscious of time that we don't have a great deal of time left, but uh, David, I wonder if you would mind asking, you've got a great question here, David Derbyshire. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes, I think you, you, you mentioned a lot of it, but what do you think about the issues of uh, masculinity and femininity in the yeah. scriptures? Um, it, and, it, yes. Yeah. And that also raises questions about um, uh, uh, people who identify as trans, right? People yes. who identify as intersex yeah. and all that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm actually working with a number of students on projects related to those issues right now. Um, sometimes the metaphors are helpful. Paul talks about giving birth, right? Um, mm. And you can see that in Galatians. So, um, or in, uh, oh, so coming up to Good Friday, um, it, it, when Jesus is on the cross in the Gospel of John, he's penetrated by a spear um, and blood and water rush out. And that's a parturition image because blood and water is, that's what comes out of a uterus when, it, when, you, when you give birth. So, and plus you have the, the insertion of this you know, spear. Um, so I think, I think this is a gender bending image. Um, you can look at the followers of Jesus as well as people in, in, the, old, in the Old Testament as also doing a fair amount of gender bending. Um, but generally that, that is in fact not strange because that's in part how literature works. Um, one of the things that makes literary characters mm. interesting is they're not, nor they go against the norm because otherwise they'd just be, you know, they'd be boring. Anybody who does everything that's perfectly normal is just on the whole, you know, they might be nice, but they're kind of dull. Mm. Um, so literary characters in the Bible will sometimes bend gender norms. Um, and I think Jesus does that frequently. Um, he's, the gender norm at the time is if you're a man, you get married, you have a family. He does mm. neither. So there's, there's already a bending here. Um, uh, you set up a new fictive kinship group. I think he's celibate. Um, and to be celibate in a society where having children is considered a great blessing and a great mm. concern is, is going against normative gender roles as well as going against normal sexual roles. Um, so you, you can start looking at how bodies function. Eucharistic models, this is my body, take it and eat it. Um, uh, giving up the, the masculine privilege and providing food for all, that's what women do. So you, you can play with this kind of gender disruption. The problem comes in where um, mm. on the other side where the, the Jewish society gets cast as this rigid gender role model and then Jesus comes in and disrupts it all. When in yep. fact, people are disrupting it all the time. Um, and then you can start mm. playing with how that works. So gender, gender's never been permanent. You've got people who will sometimes enforce certain gender roles, but even, even at times when you have the most restrictive gender roles possible, there are always people transgressing. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Okay. Well, we've got just a few minutes left and I wonder if there's maybe, uh, if I open it up for one or two more questions and, and uh, we can kind of finish up. Does anyone have a burning question? Right, and remember, you can always write to me. Yeah. Can I just ask a quickie, Daniel? Are we recording this? Yes, we are. Thank God. And um, <laughs> I'll, and, and and AJ, I'll be writing to you. <laughs> it's all good. Once it's I get my head around it all. Cheers. Yeah. No, I mean, I I think the best one of the best things that you can do with the Bible is ask questions. Um, and that's what I'm trying to get my students to do. And a lot of them grew up in systems where you don't ask questions, you just memorize verses. Um, uh, it, it, it must be interpreted. It, it has to be. Um, and I, I point out to them, we're always interpreting anyway. So that when Jesus says, you know, if your eye offends you, pluck it out, does he actually expect you to do that? Because I'm not seeing as many eye patches otherwise as, as you, you know, oh, no, that's metaphor. Okay. Well, how do you know? And what do you take as metaphor and what do you take as literal? And as soon as you do that, you're interpreting. And then I tell my stu my fundamentalist students that you're interpreting. And they go, oh, well, figure out some more stuff and then learn the history behind it so you can get a sense of what people at the time might have been hearing. You know, what are the possibilities? Recognize that you've got four different versions of the same story. So it may be impossible to get back to that original, but you can talk about the memory. Why did we remember the story this way? And if the memory doesn't work because you need to change it, and this is social memory theory, then you change the memory and you adapt. So the memory of Jesus has been changed through the centuries. The memory of Judas has been changed through the centuries. Um, Judas back then was this horrible, horrible person. Today, I think of him as in a jumpsuit, 
singing really good songs from Jesus Christ Superstar or Harvey Keitel. Um, so, you know, the image of Judas has changed. The image of the various Marys have changed. Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute. She only became a prostitute in the fifth century. Look at the art, look at the culture, look at the reception history and figure out today what readings are healthy and what readings are harmful and try to make sure you come up with the healthy readings. And if people have harmful ones, give them alternatives rather than just say, um, cause I don't think they are, you're a bigot, you're superstitious. No, they're trying to read faithfully. Give them other faithful readings. Keep the conversation going. That's brilliant. Um, Claire, you had a question, you had your hand up. You're there. Me too. Yeah. Which of the four gospels do you think has got the most historical value? Quick question. <laughs> uh, I think the passion narrative in John is probably closer to what happened. And I think the synoptic teachings in the galley are probably closer to what happened. Okay, thank you. I think, you, I think Jesus spoke in parables. Um, they seem to be a genre distinctly connected to him. You don't find them in Acts, for example. You mm -hmm. don't find them in the, the New Testament Apocrypha very much. Um, so I think I think those are Jesus. I think that's solid Jesus material. I think the Our Father is solid Jesus material. But I think the chronology in John makes more sense overall. Um, I think Jesus being in and out of Jerusalem makes more sense than a one-time shot, which is what you get in Mark. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think I don't think there was a, a, a hearing of Jesus, a, a Sanhedrin hearing at all. Um, in in John, there's simply a hearing before Annas, who's the father-in-law of the reigning high priest. That strikes me as more likely. But I don't think Jesus and Pontius Pilate had this really long chat either. Thank you. You're welcome. That's really helpful. Really helpful. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I feel I'm not quite sure how to finish off something like that. I feel like I might need a nap. <laughs> thank you so much. Is there any, anything anyone else would like to say before we say a big thank you? I'm just, you have asked like the best questions. I am delighted delighted to work with you and and i hope this will not be the first of many occasions and god willing at some point i will be able to come visit you we'd love that we'd love that yeah. i mean so, so much of the way you've spoken resonates with how how we view com community I and mean, we kind of say every week um questions are the main thing and that you being part of our community is not about what you do or don't believe it's we're here together to journey together to ask questions because if you don't have um, a space where you can actually ask the deepest questions and have different opinions, how can you actually grow and learn together without being afraid you're going to get chucked out? <laughs> I think that's right. And then when you ask me questions, then I can think, okay, um, these are very good questions. I need to go back and inform my students about these very good questions because if they're going to be effective clergy, they need to know what people who are not clergy are asking um, mm. or who may be clergy are asking so that they would be prepared as well. That's great. Right. So, I mean, so it's extremely helpful to me. Plus it's fun. It is fun. We'd love to have you back another time. Does anyone have anything, any last words before we say thank you and goodbye? Shalom. Shalom. All good. <laughs> Shalom. Zeigesund as we would say. Thank in you very much. <laughs> um, and for those of you who, who are celebrating Easter next week, you know, happy Palm Sunday today. Happy, happy Easter. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, carry on the good fight because I'm, I'm so pleased that you are doing what you were doing. And it's, it's nice to know that you're not alone out there. Mm. All Thank good. you so much. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. -bye.